This is BBC Radio 4. Our comedy this evening has been described by a leading newspaper as a seductive experience. Tom Tuck goes straight to DVD, examining the perplexingly lucrative career of the Olsen twins. That's coming up in a moment. Meantime, over on Radio 4 Extra now, Weird Tales. The Loop is the story of a mysterious and sinister archaeological find accidentally unearthed by workmen excavating the London Underground in 1906. It's a chiller. Mira Sayal on To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I was introduced to it when I was 13 on a visit to India and we were at the house of a very close friend who had a hippie younger brother. He said, you must listen to this and read this. He handed me Carol King's tapestry <laughs> album in one hand and in the other was To Kill a Mockingbird. And I did read it over that holiday in India and it completely blew me away and, and changed the way I regarded myself and thought about the world. 75 creative minds share their inspiring moments in cultural exchange. New to Front Row, from next Monday at 7.15 on BBC Radio 4. So now, once again, shining a light on the dark corners of the entertainment industry and unearthing more gems from the straight-to-DVD market so that we don't ever have to endure watching them. It's Tom Tuck. Welcome to Tom Tuck Go Straight to DVD. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tom Tuck, which is a real human name. <laughs> Each week I've been delving into a different nook or cranny of the entertainment industry to try and better understand this ludicrous world in which we live by watching straight to DVD films. <laughs> this week I will be examining the enticing world of Teen Guff. <laughs> Episode 3. The aggressively commercial cinematic works of the dead-eyed millionaires Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. <laughs> now, if you don't know anything about the Olsen twins as they are known, now is a good time for a brief primer. Mary Kate and Ashley, that's two people, one of them has a hyphen. <laughs> the Olsen twins are American twins who have been in the public eye since the age of one. They then proceeded to corner the prepubescent market for vapid wish fulfillment tosh. <laughs> And they really wouldn't be worth talking about if it weren't for the fact that they have been truly, stupendously successful. They have been so successful that if you were to count them as one person, they would be the 11th richest woman in America. <laughs> How does that tally with everything you know about anything they have ever done? Why do they have all the money? I've got practically none of it. <laughs> 11th richest woman in America, and that is almost true. <laughs> And it makes sense to count them as one person, because look at them! Look at them, they seem to only have enough DNA between them for one whole person. <laughs> they are really creepy looking, as if E.T. had a bit of work done. <laughs> but they've made their money not just through television, but through an aggressive commercial operation that existed in the slipstream of their TV work. Christmas albums, coffee table books, tie-in novellas and at least three fashion lines. I actually had an Olsen Twins visor <laughs> that I bought in a charity shop and I loved that thing. <laughs> it, it was denim with gold stenciled stars and a red underside. It was awesome because everybody hated it. <laughs> so I wore it uh, typically on a first date. <laughs> We, we went through to Glasgow on the train to see a concert and, and then we missed the bus back to Edinburgh. So we went over the road to a nightclub and danced a bit and then we went to get the next bus, which we missed. <laughs> Repeat almost ad nauseum. <laughs> and we finally got the 3am bus, but by then I had mislaid the visor. And in many ways I've been looking for it ever since. <laughs> that girl I was talking about and I went out for six years. When I wrote my first radio show about Disney straight to DVD movies, we had broken up. But we, we met up so she could tell me that she definitely didn't have the passport, which she did have. <laughs> she asked me what I was up to and I said I was writing a show about Disney and Heartbreak. And a horrified look came over her face. <laughs> and she said, are you writing about me? And I said, oh no. And then she looked relieved and then horrified again. <laughs> I said, why not? <laughs> And I thought about it for a while, and then I said something I advise you never say to an ex-girlfriend. Well, you don't fit the narrative. <laughs> and 
she looked deeply put out. <laughs> well, Chuck, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I am not someone who usually makes wise choices. Unlike the Olsons, who, who decided to become executive producers of their films and TV series at age nine. <laughs> How are they so good at life? <laughs> if you type O... L.S. into the search box on imdb.com. The first person who pops up is Elizabeth Olsen, their sister and far more respected actress. <laughs> their next person is Mary Kate. And then it's Eric Christian Olsen, an unrelated man. <laughs> Why is nobody searching for Ashley? <laughs> because she doesn't go out with Nicholas Sarkozy's brother. <laughs> Mary Kate does. <laughs> it's very creepy. <laughs> He's almost twice her age and almost twice her height. <laughs> the first movie of the 12 they made before they were legally allowed to vote is a little bit of nonsense called To Grandmother's House We Go. <laughs> it stars the twins as identical irritating characters with, with Rhea Perlman from Off Off Cheers and Jerry Van Dyke, who is Dick Van Dyke's little brother. A little bit of backstory on Jerry Van Dyke. At CBS, the American TV network, decided they were going to make him their next star and offered him loads of parts. And one of them, them was in Gilligan's Island, which went on to become a massive success, and he turned it down. The show that he accepted, the show he read the script for, thought deeply about and went, yep, oh, that's the one for me, was a short-lived sitcom called My Mother the Car. <laughs> Where Jerry Van Dyke played a man whose mother had died, who was reincarnated as, yes, a car. It was unsurprisingly short-lived. So, by 1992, Jerry Van Dyke needed some dollar. So to grandmother's house he went. A second film was much in the same vein, Double Double Toil and Trouble, it's called. It stars the twins as reasonably inexplicable children, alongside Will from Will and Grace and Oscar winner Cloris Leachman. <laughs> now, she plays both a good witch and a bad witch. It's very good. One of them is trapped in a mirror. <laughs> and it's, but it's only got one of the hallmarks of what was to become classic Olsen. They've already mastered the trick of saying something, nodding, and walking off camera in tandem. This becomes a major part of their later work. <laughs> their third film is How the West Was Fun. <laughs> Answer, it isn't. I went to Glastonbury once. Do you know Glastonbury? It's sort of like a left-wing holding pen. <laughs> Face paint optional. And I, I'd have been paid to go, and all I had to do for my money was, for an hour a day, put on a hat, which had sheep's horns on it. Yep, if anything, that's a bonus. <laughs> Little did they know I was going to spend my fee on a very similar hat. <laughs> and my girlfriend at the time, the one from the visor loss incident, didn't come with me because she hadn't been paid to go, and she hadn't bought a ticket. And even if she had bought a ticket, she wouldn't have got to camp where I got to camp which was behind the circus tent and consequently near some gymnasts. Dribble. <laughs> Do you know gymnasts? They're, they're people who are bendy for money. Because that's when you become a thing, isn't it? When you do it for money. Like, if you're believable for money, you're an actor. If you're slippery for money, you're a lawyer. If you're pointless, you're a street performer. <laughs> I always thought I could be a gymnast when I was little. I thought, being bendy, that is a revenue stream in which I want to swim. Because I can do the splits, I can put my leg behind my head, but both of these would be a lot more alluring if I was a lady. <laughs> Anyway, a lot of these gymnasts were ladies. I mean, they weren't ladies for money. That is a prostitute. <laughs> but they were bendy for money. And they were ladies. Brilliant. <laughs> it made being away from my girlfriend even harder. Technically, their next film is It Takes Two. But since that went to the cinema, I have no interest in it. <laughs> And when the synopsis of a film is Amanda as a streetwise orphan, you don't want to see it. <laughs> if you don't have to. Plus, Kirsty Alley's in it, and no one wants that. 
Now, something happened before their next film, which heralds their blue period. That's my own terminology. <laughs> their parents got divorced, their actual parents. And from then on, they mainly make movies about how their mother is dead. <laughs> I think it would be a bit of a kick in the teeth to that actual newly divorced mother. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. My beautiful girls have made another movie. What's it about? Oh. <laughs> right. No, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it's lucky their father got all the knives in the separation. <laughs> the first film in their blue period is Billboard Dad, which features a man doing a terrible English accent. <laughs> He's the baddie in this one, and at one point he pronounces the synthetic fabric that everyone in the world pronounces the same as polyester. <laughs> what? You say cotton, I say cotton. Let's not bother with research. <laughs> and the weirdest thing about this film, of which there are many weird things, <laughs> For some reason, the band No Doubt are mentioned about nine times. <laughs> I mean, presumably they paid for this? But they never appear in the film, and neither does any of their music. Just people keep going, yeah, I got awesome some tickets to the No Doubt concert, and then they don't go. <laughs> it's baffling. The plot is that they try and find a woman for their dad to hump. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they do. And, and everybody learns a lesson about diving or something. The next film is when they really start to make the movies they clearly want to make. By which I mean cold, dead, commercial husks. <laughs> Passport to Paris is classic Olsen. Sponsored to within an inch of its life and inexplicably full of montage sequences. <laughs> Usually these montages will involve them trying on clothes made by their nascent clothing lines. <laughs> and this is where on the DVDs they start to have these special features called fashion close-up. Which is clips of the film with a generic American woman spouting things like, it's all about attitude here. <laughs> That's the one accessory you should never leave home without. <laughs> or... The girls threw in this hat for a touch of whimsy. <laughs> and Mary Kate is wearing a lavender sweater with a tank underneath and some really cool silk lounging pants. <laughs> Whilst somehow resisting the urge to say, buy them. <laughs> it is unreal. Now, Passport to Paris is set in, yes, Paris. And, and they clearly filmed it there because you can see bits of Paris behind the clothes. <laughs> But apparently they didn't have permission to film in the Louvre. So instead of not having a scene in the Louvre, <laughs> they decided to have some sort of CGI version of it instead. It's completely weird. They're walking down through some sort of tunnel made of Encarta. <laughs> and as always with these films, they meet some boys. They are French boys, in this case, who terrorise them into submission whilst riding scooters. <laughs> But the twins at this point are 13. So either they're hanging around with 13-year-olds with scooters and not even Italians are that lax. <laughs> or these two French creeps legally old enough to have scooters are picking up children. <laughs> and they don't even bother to get French actors to play them, I find out. They're both played by Americans. As if you couldn't find a sexual predator in Paris. <laughs> And they're not just any Americans, either. They have the most ludicrously American names I have ever heard. One of them's called Ethan Peck. Where the hell else is he from? And the other is called Brocker. Brocker. No, that's not Barocker, because that's a girl's name. He's called Brocker Way. Can you think of a more American name than that? I mean, maybe, like, Cody Guns. And the film is sponsored to shreds. And I don't particularly want to give any of the companies who bought into this nonsense a shred more publicity. So I'm going to replace them with stuff I like. <laughs> they drink a lot of dandelion and burdock. <laughs> the, the final film of their blue period is Switching Goals. It's about soccer. 
<laughs> and they play twins who are different. One of them likes clothes and the other can play centre-back. <laughs> or something. Uh, and, and the mother isn't dead in this one, but she is a bit of an arse. <laughs> Twist the knife! Uh, Michael Sierra tries on some shoes in one scene. <laughs> and that is about it. <laughs> so I, I was at Glastonbury. <laughs> and I wanted to go see a band called The Go Team. I don't know if you know The Go Team, it's sort of jingly jangly shouting. But I, I really wanted to go see them, and no-one would come with me. Everyone I knew wanted to either go to sleep or go and see Coldplay, which are equivalent. <laughs> so I was on my own. And on my way to see the band, I passed a man who was selling booze off of a plank. I thought, how British. He was shouting, booze! A tenner! Booze! A tenner! Now, only one of those things was what he wanted. The other one was what he had, and I figured it out really quickly. <laughs> and I gave him a tenner, and he gave me a bottle of Cavoisier. Other brandies are available. <laughs> now, because I was at Glastonbury, I had to buy a hippie bag. You've got no choice in the matter. <laughs> Which isn't to say man bag, that's not the same thing. Because we all know the word hippie is non-gender specific. Because if I said there's, there's a hippie hiding back there, you wouldn't know if it was a man hippie or a woman hippie, would you? But if I said, oh, it's a hippie chick, you go, that is a woman hippie. <laughs> if I said, it's a smelly hippie, you go, that is a man hippie. <laughs> so I put my cudgel of booze into my hippie bag and I went to dance to the shouting. Now we enter full-blown Olsen. The period of time when they're at their most virulent. They did seven films in four years before they went into remission. <laughs> or started another clothing line. <laughs> the first of these is surprisingly watchable. It, it's called Our Lips Are Sealed. They better be, you're 14. <laughs> and in this, they, they, they play twins who are in, in the witness protection programme. And they are really bad at it. <laughs> They've witnessed a crime, and they're so stupid they can't stop revealing their real identities. <laughs> so in the end, they get sent to Australia and are chased by the bad guys who come from a fictional country called You're Ugly. So they can do that joke too many times. <laughs> a couple of Olsen touchstones crop up here for the first time. They leave camera in tandem, but now they do it after saying something cutting and putting on sunglasses. <laughs> They invented that <laughs> in 2002. <laughs> Remarkable. <laughs> and they also pioneer the direct address of camera. It's as if they're looking deep into your soul and daring you to point out that Annie Hall is a better film. <laughs> they drink three cans of dandelion and burdock each. <laughs> and they meet some boys. There are seven montage sequences. <laughs> They try clothes on in five of them. <laughs> the next film is actually the first one I watched because my girlfriend's little sister lent it to me. I watched them out of order. Irresponsible! <laughs> it's called Winning London. What does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, they go to London to do the Model UN and they win, which is, I'm not sure that's how the UN works. <laughs> Although Russia might beg to differ. <laughs> Satire. <laughs> Take that, Putin. Don't kill me. <laughs> but finally, the girls have got the films exactly how they want them. Completely paid for by corporate entities. Monstrously vacuous. And clearly quite a lot of fun to do. <laughs> Not to watch. <laughs> they go on for ages about how crap Chad is. I mean, that's the country, not just an American. <laughs> I can only imagine how they took that in N'Djamina. <laughs> Captain Chaz. <laughs> Didn't even have to look that up. <laughs> I mean, I did check it, but I had typed it first. <laughs> this is a country that borders Sudan has been under military dictatorship since 1990, is listed as a failed state and is routinely adjudged to be the most corrupt country in the world. 
The last thing they need is those two skinny twits weighing in. <laughs> Once again, they speak a lot directly to camera. Wants to ask for subtitles. <laughs> when they're talking to a cab driver. This leads to them learning Cockney and is completely as excruciating as it sounds. <laughs> the film is, is clearly sponsored by Dandelion and Burdock, uh, Twiglets, Hundreds and Thousands, Buckfast and the Internet. <laughs> There are six montage sequences. <laughs> the next film is Holiday in the Sun, which is clearly their excuse for making this, Tosh. Because they're sponsored by some resort in the Bahamas and, I don't know, Greg's, why not? <laughs> and, and, and the filthy commercialism extends now into the scripts. Shopping. What a beautiful word. No, it isn't. It's a fairly ugly word to describe a concept that you are selling to impressionable children. Beautiful word. It's not archipelago. Or puce. Or kettle. The film is about nothing for absolutely ages. And then they steal a speedboat because they're convinced that there are some valuable statues on it or something. And I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote this had originally written a drug smuggling movie. And then when they got this job, just did find and replace cocaine with indigenous artifacts. It's nonsense. There are six montage sequences. <laughs> then there is getting there. Tagline, half the fun is getting there. <laughs> None of the fun is getting there. It is so stomach-turningly stupid and empty. They're in a car for a bit. That is the plot. <laughs> Once again, they also appear to have got some money from a musician to say their name. Because I can't figure out any other reason for anyone to say the line as they leave a private jet, Hey! I feel like Kid Rock! <laughs> what? You feel mildly culturally irrelevant and empty inside? There is nothing to recommend this film. No one should ever watch this again. Please, if you see a copy of this on DVD, buy it and smash it! <laughs> so, I, I, I was at Glastonbury. <laughs> and after I danced to the shouting, I had to make new friends because, because nobody had come with me. But I had some booze. So I said to people, do you want some of the brandy? And they were like, yes, do you want some of the friendship? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and then I accidentally took some of the drugs. <laughs> I smoked some of the drugs. But apparently you're not, you're not, you're not to have it after quite so much brandy. <laughs> so I found out it was a muddy year at Glastonbury. Very quickly. With my face. <laughs> Have you seen When in Rome? <laughs> it's the worst. Not just in terms of message, but cinematography. All too often, it goes black and white for no real reason, and the camera angle tilts, and it slowly starts panning. I watch this over Christmas with my sister, and the best thing about this film is quite how furious it made her. <laughs> They're doing an internship at a fashion house and they get fired justifiably. <laughs> but then the boss turns up and goes, hey, come to my house in Tuscany or whatever. Not a direct quote. And <laughs> so they do and then they meet some boys and whilst they're selling themselves, one of them says the most offensive thing I've ever heard. Hey, unemployment's not that bad. <laughs> There are nine montage sequences, <laughs> which is a high tide mark for the girls. <laughs> the challenge is the final straight-to-DVD instalment in the Twins' empire-building process. It's admirable, in a way, in that the plot isn't simply go there, kiss an adult, buy a hat. <laughs> they meet some boys, five and seven years their senior, do seven montage sequences and drink gallons of diet dandelion and burdock. <laughs> The most memorable bit of the film, by which I mean that I am still having nightmares about it, <laughs> is the ending. They're walking down the beach, having learned a lesson about something, and talking to their boys. And then... Mm -hmm. Four. 
of their previous boyfriends turn up. <laughs> As in the boyfriends from the previous films <laughs> where they are playing different characters. <laughs> they just wander in and start arguing about how they have a greater claim to be their beau and they start calling them by their real names. Brocker's there. <laughs> and the girls tell them off because, quote, you're only our movie boyfriends. <laughs> and then they wander off <laughs> and a montage sequence of clips from all of their previous films starts playing under a UB40 song. I just couldn't deal with it. So I was at Glastonbury. <laughs> and I woke up in the hospital tent. With the beautiful staff looking down at me. Me looking up at them. And one of them said, What have you taken? <laughs> um. A series of short-term decisions. <laughs> No. What have you taken? Uh oh. Oh, the drugs. Which ones? And I tried to say MDMA. I hadn't had any MDMA. But I wasn't quite sure at this point what I had taken. And that's an easy one to say. So that is what I tried to say. But sometimes my mouth will say to my brain, you know what? I've got this. <laughs> um. GNVQ. <laughs> no. That's a qualification. <laughs> Barely. Because <laughs> even hammered, I'm a snob. <laughs> Where's your phone? It's in the hippie bag, it's by the brand, did you? and they rang the number I had most recently called, which was my girlfriend at the time, and the time was 5 a.m. She didn't answer, which was lucky. What was not lucky is that they then rang the number I'd second most recently called, which was the landline of the place she was staying at the time, and the time was still 5 a.m. She was staying with her friend, whose father happens to be the editor of The Economist. <laughs> and her situation at that moment in time and my situation at that moment in time are a microcosm of why we're no longer together. <laughs> and while I was being irresponsible and then learning the consequences, the Olsen twins were retiring from the movie business. <laughs> retiring. Having already made more money than I am ever going to at aged 18. They then went on to expand their fashion businesses and become style icons and wait for the royalty checks from these films to roll in. What have I done? I've got a tutu in philosophy, which is standing me in very good stead in the open job market. <laughs> decisions, decisions. Tom Tuck, 